everyone. This is Lynn Crawford with Hope Dementia Support. And we are fortunate enough to have Melissa Morrison here from Peace Health, where she does advanced care planning education. And I would like her to uh, give you a little bit more about herself. So welcome, Melissa. And just before you start, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll be sure they're answered before the end of the evening. So, Melissa, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Lynn. And yeah, if you want to raise your hand, too, if you keep an eye on that. Um, but like Lynn said, my name is Melissa Morrison. I work um, at Peace Health in the Advanced Care Planning Department. And then I also have a couple other jobs where I do patient advocacy um, and help do coaching and consulting around the patient experience. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Let's do this. All right. I'm, I'm hoping you can see it. Looks good. Wonderful. So tonight we're going to be talking about compassion fatigue moral distress and burnout. Um, and I will apologize in advance. This presentation was originally designed for healthcare providers and people working the front line of healthcare. I do see this group of the folks that really are uh, caregiving for loved ones as also all of this information is applicable, but uh, there might be a few slides that are kind of health carry. So my apologies in advance. And one of the things that we do at my organization is we do what's called a reflection to kind of help ground us uh, before any type of meeting or presentation. Sometimes these are prayers, sometimes these are quotes, um, and I prefer to do things that are kind of funny, but really true. Um, so this is the one I really like. It says how I should be doing, what the doctors advise against, and then current situation. And I don't know about all of you, but I can definitely relate to feeling like that current situation from time to time. So our goals and objectives today really talk about what is burnout, what is compassion fatigue, and how can we grow from that? Um, how can we make ourselves um, adapt in, in, into a way that's more resilient and what's called post-traumatic growth? We're also going to talk about the mental and physical implications of burnout and compassion fatigue and share pathways to healing and pathways to getting to that post-traumatic growth. So why do we want to think about these things? Well, because stress exists. Many things we experience may have an emotional component or a trigger that can leave us drained. And sometimes it can be things that we don't expect. And as caregivers, we support others during challenging times for them, including both caring for loved ones and caring for fellow caregivers. So just thinking about even in my own life, um, my coworker is a caregiver and we try to care for each other as we're caring for our families. So here is the, how we define caregiver. In simple terms, a caregiver is a person who tends to the needs or concerns of a person with short or long-term limitations due to illness, injury, or disability. And I did put a statistic in here that caregiving in America is on the rise. Broadly speaking, over 100 million U.S. adults function as caregivers, providing care to a child, a parent, or another relative. More narrowly, there are 53 million U.S. adults who are who care for a spouse or an elderly parent or relative or a special needs child. And as the baby boomer generation is aging, this number is continuing to rise. And this is, I really like this diagram that helps explain burnout. So burnout is a cumulative process marked by emotional exhaustion and withdrawal associated with increased workload and it's not related to trauma. It can be stress or workload related. So I'm sure in your lives, there have been times that you were bored um, or, or understimulated. And if any of you had kids, I'm sure you can recall your kids telling you how bored they were. Um, sometimes that's where they are when it comes to this understimulated area where 
you're under-involved, you're, you're bored, you're under-stimulated. And then you get to this peak place where you feel like you have enough going on. You, you feel like you're right at the, at the place where you should be for optim, optimum effectiveness. Um, and then as more gets added to our plates, um, and I found this in adulthood, I don't know that I've been bored in decades. So that tells you something. Um, the more you get put that put that's put on your plate, um, or more stress that's added, you know, it reduces our efficiency. It reduce it reduces our creativity, um, and we become overloaded. It can be hard to concentrate, and ultimately we can get irritable, anxious, and you can see where it goes from there. And that is what burnout is. Um, life pressures in general. Compassion fatigue is a little bit different. Compassion fatigue is the deep um, physical and spiritual exhaustion that can result from internalizing the pain and suffering of others. So as we are around other people that are suffering, whether that's with uh, physical limitations, um, emotional limitations, mental limitations, um, we can internalize that and it can cause us pain. And I, I found this really great video that I thought was a little bit more applicable to this group uh, that I would like to play for you. Let me see if I can get it to go. And if someone can just tell me if they can hear it once I start it. Can you hear it? Not hearing it. Do you have the ability to turn up your volume? Is it not very loud for you guys? It's like I can almost tell that somebody's talking. Okay, let me see here. Let me share sound. There we go. Okay, let me try this again. There. Better? Yes, that's fine. Caregivers, both professionals and family members, experience at times the wear and tear that results from offering care and compassion to others. It can be difficult to care for yourself while you are caring for others. In addition, direct or secondary exposure to traumatic events or situations can bring about complicated feelings and emotions. This presentation suggests ways to create your own toolbox for self-care and burnout prevention. Compassion is loving kindness towards someone combined with the desire to take action to relieve suffering. Compassion is an essential quality for helpers. When someone feels satisfaction from helping, that is known as compassion satisfaction. Compassion fatigue is the physical and mental exhaustion resulting in a depleted ability to cope. During these times, it can be hard to refuel and regenerate. Compassion fatigue can lead to anxiety and depression. It can compromise the quality of care and affect relationships with family members and even colleagues. Secondary trauma, also known as vicarious trauma, is the contagious trauma that occurs when helpers are repeatedly exposed to others' traumatic experiences. Take heart because there are things we can do to cope with compassion fatigue and burnout and help us avoid them in the future. Create a protection plan for yourself. Pay attention to your feelings. Make it a point to stop and check in with yourself during the day to see how you are feeling. Some people even find it helpful to write in a journal at the end of the day. Practice self-care by doing those things that recharge your battery. Maintain strong social supports at home and at work. And have a transition from work to home. 
as this can help us let go of the trials of the day. Remember to practice being kind to yourself. Respond to your stress with care and support. You are managing a lot and doing your very best. When we practice self-compassion, we build resilience and it can help us be more attuned to others. Caregiving can be challenging and rewarding. Practicing these simple strategies may help you avoid compassion fatigue and burnout and increase your compassion satisfaction. I feel like this is really important and there are a lot of strategies for coping. Um, but one of the things I just want to continuously reiterate is that being kind to yourself and continuously checking in with yourself about where you are on that spectrum of too little, too much, so that you don't burn out, um, so that compassion fatigue doesn't get to you. And you will notice some of the signs of it. You'll become more irritable and cranky about things that probably don't really matter in the real world. I had a coworker who was an ethicist, and she said that when she got home one day and started getting mad at her husband because he misplaced the salt shaker, that's when she knew that she was probably suffering from compassion fatigue, or she had been dealing with a lot of things and internalizing those things. Um, and it came out in a really weird way for her. Um, but luckily, she had that self-awareness. So that's what I would hope for all of us. Um, also, I will say that Mother Teresa understood compassion fatigue and she wrote in her plan to superiors that it was mandatory for nuns to take an entire year off from duties every four to five years to allow them to heal from the effects of their caregiving work. So this has been something that people have recognized for a, for a while now um, and is probably something as, um, as timeless as caregiving itself. So here's kind of a graph of, that shows what that looks like, what compassion fatigue the process looks like. So we have we all have an ability to have empathy. Um, and if we are in the caregiving field or caring for a loved one, we probably have a bit more empathy than others that that, that don't do those kinds of things. Um, but that prolonged exposure to suffering um, can take a toll on our empathetic response. Um, causing us to have more stress um, and what they call compassion stress. So it's kind of like a compounds um, your, your stress level. And then ultimately, you know, tying into the, the length of that going on, plus traumatic memories, other life demands, those can all contribute to compassion fatigue. And you'll see it. Um, you'll see it in the ways that you might not be able to sleep very well. Um, your emotional intensity might increase. You might be more sensitive than you maybe normally would be. Uh, cognitive abilities decrease. Behavior and judgment impairment. Um, you might feel isolated or like your morale might be gone. Um, sometimes people think that they're depressed or potentially having like PTSD. Um, these things can come from compassion fatigue. Um, identity, worldview, and spirituality impacts, loss of hope, um, anger towards people, like I said, or even for casual events, like my friend with the salt shaker. Um, so if you find yourself being more irritable or getting upset about things or not sleeping, um, these could be signs that you need to think about what's on your plate and how you're caring for yourself. And I'm curious for folks just to put in the chat what contributes to their burnout and compassion fatigue. Um, like if there are competing priorities, what would what are those things? And I can't see the chat, so I'm hoping that Lynn is helping me monitor this. I have my eye on it. Thank you. Um, the Schwartz Center is actually um, an organization that helps uh, healthcare workers. Basically, it's like a support group for healthcare workers. 
Um, and they have different topics and they meet monthly. And so some of these slides come from them. Um, but basically they talk about the psychological distress that comes from, um, com from caregiving basically. So we have burnout, which we talked about already. Uh, there's empathy, distress, feeling overwhelmed by the pain and suffering of others. Um, that's, that's a hint for you that you might be heading down that compassion fatigue uh, highway. Moral distress, um, which I hope isn't happening too much, but it can. Um, and this is where individual or systemically entrenched behaviors violate your moral values. If you're seeing things that are happening around you that don't um, adhere to your moral values, um, that could be part of moral distress. Even seeing a loved one acting in a way that you aren't used to seeing them act, um, maybe doing stuff that, that doesn't fit your moral values, whether that's violent interactions or behaviors um, or whatnot, that can definitely lead to moral distress. Grief and loss, um, loss of people in your life that you used to be able to spend time with, loss of cherished activities or things, hobbies that you might be used to do. Um, or even aspects of yourself that you haven't really been able to get in touch with for a while. Um, and you could even grieve these for your loved ones that you're caring for too. So that grief and loss is real. Or things that you did together. Physical and mental health. So physical and mental exhaustion. Um, fear that you're going to rub off on other people. Um, whether that be like an actual infection or even just a mood. Your mood can rub off on somebody. Um, and then not feeling like you have adequate supplies or resources. It says leadership abandonment. In this case, I would say that it's, it could potentially just mean um, that you don't have enough support, um, whether that be through whatever avenues that there might be support. Um, but that can be a big thing that really does uh, impact our psychological distress. Comments from the chat. Yeah. When I feel that my father is not really understanding the joy of life, focusing on money and material things, when the given day is the gift, we are so different. Yeah. And oh, Nancy says, doing everything, especially those things out of my gifts, cooking, for example. Yeah. And Martha says, not having time away. That's a huge one. Respite is so huge. Making time for yourself, even if it's just an hour to go get a pedicure or to go to a bookstore or a library and pick up a book. Those are luxuries sometimes that we don't realize um, are actually necessities. Um, but in the caregiving field, I, I know what that's like to crave having just a few minutes to yourself. So this picture, I'm curious what people see in this picture or note in this picture. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. This is a landscape um, that is called Fall of Icarus. Um, and it has to do with a poem that was written um, a long time ago. Um, and basically um, this is part of a, like a fable where um, there was a, a guy, Icarus, and his father, they were trying to escape the island that you see there um, because there was a lot of stuff going on there that they didn't like, a lot of persecution and whatnot. So the kid decided that he was going to build a flying machine. And the dad said to the kid, be careful not to fly too close to the sun because it will burn the wings and you will fall into the sea. Um, and so this picture is basically a picture of that happening. So you can see a lot of things are going on around the, on the scenes. You can see people just going about their day, their ships in the harbor. Um, and then I don't know if you guys can see this, but in the bottom right corner, there is a guy drowning. Um, and it seems as if most of the people don't really notice this. Um, and I bring this up in relation to burnout and compassion fatigue, because I feel like this painting is a really um, honest representation of what that can feel like for us. 
Um, and this is, I think this was from like the 15th century or something. So this legend is, um, is pretty interesting. And the idea that even when people look at this picture, even today, they don't often notice the person that's drowning in the corner. Um, and I, I do this presentation a lot with uh, various caregivers, healthcare workers. Um, and it's interesting, the people that have noticed the person drowning um, are the chaplains um, and people in the spiritual field. But when I ask others, um, it sometimes isn't noticed. Um, and there's a lot to be said there, a lot of parallels there of like how we can feel sometimes that we're working really hard and we are potentially drowning and no one sees it. Um, or, you know, it just might be a, a normal day for everyone else. So, so a, a couple of other comments in the chat. Uh, Susan says uh, uh, something that is difficult for her is having to repeat over and over and over the same information so many times a day. Yeah. And then Tom so says, good. that is so right. It is so hard when it comes to two to five times at a time. It's so hard to keep your patience. Yeah. So hard. Yeah. You can feel like you're drowning just in those moments of just trying to keep your cool so that you don't, uh, yeah, lose it. These are the seven C's that they talk about when it comes to stress first aid, um, which I do really like. So when those things happen, when you are having to repeat yourself over and over and over and you're going to, you feel like you're going to lose it. Um, the fact that you notice that you're feeling that way, that's the first thing is um, noticing that, um, checking in, trying to find if you can get to safety. And I don't mean this in terms of like your house is on fire, but these stressors are real. And so finding a way to get to safety, even if you can leave for a second and get a breath outside or go to the bathroom and just wash your hands or anything, pet the dog, whatever it is for you to be able to recenter yourself um, and trying to focus on your breathing, relaxing, slow down. Um, and if you can get support from others, even if it's just a quick text, a quick phone call, that is really important. Making sure that you have a support system in place is really vital for these things. Um, otherwise, you're going to have that cumulative effect where it does just overwhelm um, and get to be too much and takes the toll on our own physical and mental health. And then trying to find a way to uh, restore um, effectiveness. So it's not that we don't know what to do. It's just that we need to take a breath there and uh, hear from other people that they're going through it too. I think that's really important to know that you're not alone. Um, and then basically restoring your hope for that. So it is kind of a cycle. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, but if you can try to get some of these steps in, it is really important. Uh, for caregivers to do that. And I know when you're caregiving for somebody at home, that can be really hard. Another, um, another comment kind of going along with that is the hardest part for me is not to get drawn into to the delusions of my father. I oftentimes find myself going along with the delusion only to later understand that it's not reality. And then I kick myself for not making a diversion earlier to get onto something positive. Yeah, that's tough. And I think we have to give ourselves grace there. We're doing the best we can. Um, and if you have to remind yourself of that in ways, writing things on the bathroom mirror about giving yourself grace, uh, really important because um, it can be hard. So you can see here, like this is kind of the circle of supports and hoping that you can get these things where, you, you know, trying to figure out what your resources are, your resources for mental health, for stress relief, whether that's exercise or other things that help you, artistic things, um, whatever it is that helps you relieve stress. Um, talking with your doctor as well about some of that, looking into respite resources, uh, things like that. Um, social support, support groups like HOPE are really important for that. Just like I said, knowing you're not alone. Um, having enough time, that's a huge one. I, I still haven't figured that one out. 
um, belief system, spirituality, that can be a really big one for people too. Nutrition. So even just like making sure that you are taking care of yourself. Are you eating? You know, I told my coworker today, don't forget to eat. Like sometimes we have to remind ourselves of the basic things. Don't forget to use the bathroom. Um, we get so wrapped up in caring for others that we are just completely neglecting ourselves. So responding with self-care helps build resilience. So I know these things might seem simple or maybe even sometimes hard to make happen, but building a routine, whatever that looks like is really vital. Um, I like this wheel cause it touches on different aspects of self-care. Um, I, and I heard in that video, they talked about journaling or meditation, um, any way that you can have time to self-reflect. That's really important. Um, and sometimes, like I said, that can just be like taking a few minutes to go to the bathroom and think to yourself just to have a minute of quiet, um, exploring hobbies that you might have like let go of. Um, I recently discovered paint by numbers. Like there doesn't actually have to be a lot of um, skill there, but it's really meditative for me. Um, practicing self-love. What does that look like? Are you allowing yourself to feel things? Are you allowing yourself to cry? Are you allowing yourself to laugh and feel joy? Um, spirituality. So whatever practices that, that make sense to you, dancing, singing, yoga, um, I might not recommend that this group volunteer for more causes or anything like that. Maybe that works for you. If that's really a, a spiritual outlet for you, um, then for sure, I would cautious, I would caution on taking on more. That's not going to be personally fulfilling for you, um, in a real, uh, immediate way. Um, reading a book, taking time to have coffee with a friend, even if it's once a month or, Take a walk with somebody, again, even if it's once a month, having things to look forward to. I had a boss a long time ago that used to tell me that she would try to schedule many vacations for herself. These would be little things like that are on this list. Um, and she would call them her like vacations because they really did give her that time to recoup and recharge. So whatever that looks like. We also talk about the metaphor of like how many marbles we have in our jar and how many we give away, you know, every time you're having to repeat yourself and you're going crazy every time that's a marble out of your jar and that's okay. But know that we only have so many marbles in the jar. And so I had a chaplain that I lived with for a while that she would just keep a jar of marbles in her bathroom on the counter every morning to look at, to remind herself not to give away all her marbles. Here are some other ideas. Um, there are a lot of good resources and I will share the slide deck, um, but there are some really good links and resources to help build your own self-care plan. You don't have to write it out, but if you do journal or like to do those things or do artistic expressions, it can be helpful to make a plan and to really commit to it. Um, so these are some other things, you know, making sure that you accept your needs, uh, manage your time. So prioritizing activities that are going to help you um, not feel so overwhelmed, whether that's meal prepping on a Sunday or, um, you know, doing your laundry on a certain day of the week so that you're not worrying about getting all of these things done. Um, in the middle of the week, it can be anything like that. Practicing relaxation and exercising daily. That can be a tough one, especially when you're caring for someone else. Um, yeah, it's just hard to make time for this stuff. Trying to get enough sleep. Um, trying to get enough sleep, going to bed at a decent hour. Um, and if you can't sleep, you know, doing the things that they always recommend, like no screen time before bed and, you know, keeping your room dark and those things, your brain sometimes just doesn't shut off. Um, avoiding alcohol or other methods of uh, reducing stress or taking the edge off and talking with people, a counselor, the support groups, friends, family. 
anyone in your life that you can. It's really important that you that you do talk about stuff. Let's see here. Making yourself a priority. It is like building a muscle, so it does take time. Um, and it takes intention. And I would be curious for you to type in the chat, uh, what types of self-care things do you do? What What's working for you now? What have you found? Are there any tips or ideas that you could share with the group about what you found works, especially if you are caring for someone most of the time? How do you find ways to get a break in? We actually uh, had one of our participants uh, say that. She started puzzles. Seemed like a silly, mindless activity until I poured the first thousand pieces out. I thought, what a mess. I can never put this together. Over a week, piece by piece, it took shape. It gave me an accomplishment and actually heightened my mental skills. Yeah. That's great. That's a good one. Um, Martha exercises at the gym. Good. That's so important. And uh, we have a lady here from Sun City, Arizona, and she oh. swims daily. Wow. That's great. Swimming can be a really good uh, way to provide, practice self-care because when you're underwater, people can't talk to you. So I really like that one. And Susan found a knitting group at the local library. Her husband comes and sits in the atrium and I can spend an hour with my knitting group. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You're with other people and you're talking about things that have nothing, you know, that are just worldly things. You're connecting with other people in a different way over a shared hobby. That's great. Ralph takes walks. Good. Yep. Yeah. So important. You guys, this is reminded me that I need to do these things. So this is really helpful. Our lady from Arizona says that uh, um, there are many single women there and they walk fast in a lane together and chat often. Oh, that's great. I love that. Beth says Meditation after he's in bed. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. EFT tapping. Beth, you have to tell me what that means. Red, walk my dog. Read, walk my dog. Breathing. Use a grounding pad for 30 minutes and write a poem a day while my feet are on the pad. I like that. Yeah. And tapping is a good thing. I, I have a couple books on tapping. I don't know that much about it, but it is um, it is a way to process, like process motions and thoughts and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of also research around, like I think it's called somatic um, like movements or ways that you're basically processing things in a healthy way to get them out of your body, basically. Mom says we've hired a cook and a caregiver two days a week so that we can get away two days a week for four hours at a time. That is great. Yeah. Janet says audio books with my earbuds in while I'm doing tasks such as cooking, cleaning, etc. Yeah, that's a creative way to find a little bit of something that's going to feed you while you're not able to get away. Nancy says, I hired a housekeeper. Yeah, really good, really important. Judy says, crafts that I can sell on eBay. Oh, there you go. That's like a two for one, basically, because you're going to make money from that stuff. And it's fun to make them. Yeah, I invite you all to write down your ideas for self-care. And act on one of them, you know, in the next week, make a, make a plan that's going to be reasonable for you. Um, oddly enough that participants who wrote down their goals achieve those um, at a significantly higher rate than those that don't. So 
um, 42 percent more likely to uh, make it happen if you write it down, believe it or not. Kathy says that she loves to quilt. Nice. That's really good. Yeah. A lost art, I think. And I want folks to understand too that resilience is not about bouncing back. It's a dynamic adaptive process. It's how do we adapt to this new normal or this current normal? And I like this visual because of all the roots that this person is putting down. And I heard a couple of people talk about grounding exercises. Um, and thinking about all these things in our lives that ground us, um, you know, realistic optimism, you know, my loved one might not be able to do X, Y, and Z anymore, but I still really enjoy when we can do this one thing. Um, you know, having some emotional and cognitive flexibility, uh, things like that, social support, um, finding your meaning and purpose beyond just caregiving, but uh, what else is feeding you? Um, it's about being able to carry what's important um, despite painful or distressing symptoms, conditions, or circumstances. So even though we know that life is not perfect and this might not be the state that we would want it to be, um, thinking about all these things that are the roots for us. And you could even draw out your own little stick figure and put your own roots down and write down what, what this means to you, what things fit the, in those roots for you. Um, what's your moral compass look like? Um, what is, who is a role model for you in terms of uh, who you look up to in this kind of world of caregiving? Um, let's see here. So I'm going to go back one sec here. So um, compassionate trauma and resilience informed approach is used in healthcare and in, in caregiving in general to help heal ourselves. Um, and it also helps those that we're caring for. Um, let's see what else I have here. I'm not going to play this video, um, but just know that resilience can look very different depending on what it is that really feeds your soul. And then there's this topic um, this, that's called post-traumatic growth. Um, and it's the idea that even though things are hard, if we can find the space to breathe, to reflect on what's happened, um, and co-create an environment that nurtures our learning brains. So thinking about when you're in a traumatic experience or event where you're kind of in that fight or flight or freeze or fawn, I guess there's a few of them now, um, that a lot of parts of your brain turn off. And sometimes even in caregiving, like we are just in survival mode on some of our hardest days. Um, but actually taking from that you know, when you come, when you get to go to, to bed at night before you go to sleep, thinking about that um, and trying to figure out how you can create an environment that does nurture your learning brain. So it was a hard day. What did I gain from that? What did I learn about myself? Um, what did I learn about um, how, what I need? Things like that. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, PTSD and other things from trauma, but trauma can also just be um, a slow drawn out process of things being really hard and things being in a place where you can't function to your fullest potential, uh, that learning part of your brain turning off. So really having awareness about that self-awareness, practicing these things that we talked about, and then, um, using that to think about how you can transform yourself. So uh, what is the result of this struggle of this adversity? What are we getting out of it? Um, and oftentimes that is the beautiful flower that comes from the growth. Um, just like in this picture, it really is um, figuring out, you know, shifting that survival brain back to learning brain, discovering that we have a new or enhanced skill that we didn't have before, or a new or enhanced perspective. And I could probably, I would probably wager to bet that everyone on this call has 
a lot of skills around how to do caregiving well, um, or at least better than you did it six months ago or a year ago. Things that you can help others who are maybe just starting down this path. Think about all of those things. Think about who you were before you began caregiving and where you are now. And that is what they call post-traumatic growth. Um, when we discover those things about ourselves, um, it basically helps us grow, helps us um, on a spiritual and a larger scale to basically become more enhanced humans, um, whether that's more compassionate, more patient, whatever qualities that you're, you're gaining from that. Um, you know, to have to repeat yourself several times over and over and over again, that takes a significant amount of um, patience and, and uh, kindness. So thinking about those kinds of things. Um, none of us really have a clear idea of like what this looks like caregiving for our loved ones that are suffering from whether a physical or um, cognitive illness. Um, but we don't know what that is, but we, we can try to make a new normal and we can try to uh, find ways to grow. Um, even like you said, the puzzles, like the fact that that's giving you some increased um, like brain power, you know, like your brain is working in ways that you haven't stretched it in a while. Uh, those are things that are really important. So the way this is defined is the transformative positive change that can occur as a result of a struggle um, or as a result of a great adversity. And I would, I would say that everybody on this call is likely um, had that or is experiencing that. I mean, even just caring for a loved one with, um, with dementia or other, other, like I said, physical or cognitive impairments, that is a great adversity that a lot of people in America or in the world don't necessarily know how to how to, what to do with that. So making meaning out of trauma. So we talk about that as well. Um, there's an author. I don't know if any of you have read this book. Um, his name is Victor Frankel. And he wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was, um, he was an Austrian uh, psychiatrist. And he was in the Holocaust. And his book really talks about under the most gravely uh, horrible, uh, deplorable conditions, um, how he found meaning being in a concentration camp, watching other people starve to death and work to death and go through some tremendous hardships. Um, and, and many of them lost their lives. Um, but he does talk about, you know, the fact that he was able to find meaning even out of such such a terrible tragedy. Um, and he says like trauma is not in and of itself beneficial. We don't want to minimize the traumatic experience in any way, but tra trauma can ignite growth and positive change um, that results in a meaning that we hold deeply for the rest of our lives. Um, and research shows that people who make meaning out of trauma um, are, are able to actually increase their own strengths and capacities. Um, so they have a greater capacity for, um, for life. Um, they have greater sense of compassion, a greater sense of belonging, increased sense of purpose, um, and spiritual and existential changes occur as well. Um, so it might look different in everybody, this post-traumatic growth. Um, it's a process and not an outcome, um, but something that we really encourage from people. So these are some of the things that can come from it. Like I said, greater compassion, increased purpose, appreciation for life. Um, you don't take as many moments for granted. So next steps for everybody, you know, trying to distill meaning from whatever the chaos is in your life. Acknowledging trauma that's been going on, whether that be um, sustained uh, challenges or something that really did happen that was quick. Um, compassion fatigue, moral distress, any of those things, if they've happened to you, 
really finding ways to recognize that and work to get back to a place where your capacity is um, heightened. Establish time and space to reflect and create a self-care plan. Pay close attention to what your body needs and when your body needs it. Regularly practice self-care um, and share your stories and find support. There are times we get thrown off course. Um, so just paying attention to how you feel so you can get back on track um, and seek support where you need to. I kind of think about this in terms of like AA groups, like how people need a sponsor. I think that caregivers also need a support person or like a sponsor, someone to help hold us accountable for, are we taking care of ourselves? Um, you know, are we following through on the commitments that we made for ourselves? And that is the conclusion of my presentation. I do have additional slides in here that, like I said, I will share because there are some really good exercises in here um, that you can use on your own time. This one is really good. This is about thinking about a couple positive things that happened to you um, within two hours of going to sleep. And what this does is this preloads your prefrontal cortex. It'll help you sleep better, but it also improves your outlook if you do it for at least two weeks. You have to do it every night for two weeks, but it actually changes the way that your brain is wired. So there's some really good things like that in here. A um, Couple of different breathing exercises that are really important um, to help you know, boost, boost things, including your immune system. A lot of, all of this is connected, our physical health, our mental health. So making sure that we take care of it all. And then I have just a ton of resources in here on some self-care assessment tools. How are we doing with our need for self-care? Are we doing it? Are we doing it? You know, and uh, there's, there's some PDFs in here for things that you can try. So I know we that we're a little bit early, but I would love to take questions. Well, we have a comment. I'm always thinking that my dad needs more help, but some days I could leave him more than I think, but I never know what mental state he is in. So I'm always hovering. Should I be? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know how to answer that. What, what do others think? How would others answer that? Nancy had put in a comment that said she was going to put in a camera, but her daughter is moving in. Martha says, don't hover. It's too hard on you. Yeah. Nancy says, my, my neighbor watched his parents when he had to be out with a camera. Yeah, Janet Martha says, maybe just step outside for 10 minutes and see how your dad does. I like that. Baby steps. Yeah. And Judy says, or asks, is dad in a facility? Mm -hmm. I guess would be no, but. He's home. I live below him and provide daily care. Okay. Beth says, don't hover, get a companion to stay with dad and take some time for yourself. And I believe that uh, this gentleman had said that he gets uh, twice a week, four hours. Oh, good. Okay. Martha says, thank you very much, Melissa. I have to leave early. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, the main thing too, I think is just giving ourselves grace. So, you know, I can think about, oh, if you don't hover and something happens, you know, are you going to be really hard on yourself? I like the idea of baby steps. And I like the idea of cameras. They can really help us. And I think we can use technology to our benefit. Uh, Nancy makes the comment that her husband is a veteran and they provide people for different levels of care. 
I think that's a really good thing to remember that the VA has services that you may not be aware of. Yeah, they do actually have a lot of services that people don't know about. And of course, I would don't know where everyone is from, but uh, uh, for our support groups, there are, are uh, two resources that we mention to everyone. And one of them is the Agency on Aging and Disabilities, because there are a lot of resources to be had and you won't know what they are unless you call and check. And we'll put that information in our uh, follow-up email. And then the other one, um, if you're living in Vancouver, Washington, is uh, CDM Adult Day Center, uh, where there is uh, the availability of adult day care from 10 to 3 on Monday through Friday. And that is worth investigating as well. And Tom, I see you say you uh, live in the Dalles. Uh, you might might check there. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that we actually have a, a Hope Dementia support group that is in the Columbia Gorge that uh, uh, is virtual and uh, you would be most welcome to attend. And I think you would find other people who have uh, uh, similar concerns as you do. Yeah, and maybe even know the resources in the area. But I agree, checking out your area resources um, most areas have an agency, area agency on aging. So wherever you live, um, that's an important thing to check out. Theoretically, every county in the United States has an agency on aging. I knew you would know that. Yeah. <laughs> Theoretically, I said. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and Nancy made the comment that she loves her virtual support group in Tualatin. So she lives in Arizona and attends a virtual support group from Tualatin. Well, that's and, great. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't know until Zoom came along how useful virtual support groups could be. You I know. Some, so good. Yeah. 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 For sure. I have a friend that moved to Australia and she still works out with us uh, virtually um, through these like virtual workouts that we do. Now it's like nighttime for her when it's daytime for us, but she still does it. She does it anyway. Yeah. She misses I, us. So. I used to have someone in my group during COVID who uh, lived in Florida. Yeah. And so she was attending the group at 10 o'clock at night. Wow. Every week. Um, Tom says, this opened me up so much. I appreciate the insight to what we are all going through. So thank you, Melissa, for that. Yeah. And you know, we have a little bit of time. I want to want to ask if you don't mind uh, to do something a little bit unusual. So the folks that are on this call, would you mind just just uh, uh, putting in the chat who you're caring for and and how long you've been caring for them? I would love to see that too. And I do know what it's like. I cared for my dad for many years. He's passed, but, um, and he didn't have dementia, but he definitely had some other um, significant challenges. Alzheimer's since 2005, husband has been a few years. Spouse a little over a year. Husband with early vascular dementia here in our home for two years. Five years. Four years. Dad, five years. Uh, did not know he was diagnosed with dementia eight years ago. Wow. Five years. There's so much knowledge and experience in this group. Goodness. Yeah.
I'm assuming that all of you are seeing these. If if not, we'll. Uh, I know I see. stopped reading them because I was just like yeah. kind of taking. Because you're back. reading them to yourself. So many, right? Yeah. My husband, uh, caring for for over two and a half years, he has PCA, which is a uh, rare early onset. Uh, care for my husband with early onset frontal temporal dementia, and other uh, issues since he is seventy three, and we've been doing this since nineteen or since fifty, since he was fifty six. That's wow. a long time. A long time. Steve, caring for my wife, several years, mixed dementia, Alzheimer's, Beverly, 2017, now in late stage Alzheimer's care, care for him 24-7. Beverly, I hope you're getting some support. Susan, also. Eva, caring for Doug with dementia, going on my fifth year. He has moderate level dementia. Anne, caring cared for mom for seven years until she passed in 2021. Susan, also PCA, the rare type. Wow. Do Susan and Janet know one another? They should if they don't. Yeah. Ralph Heiser, 88 year old man, two year care for him and his wife in my community. Gary says 77 year old wife for five years yeah. <laughs> janet says no no yeah you guys need to to figure out if you're in the same town even if you're not i think it's so important that we're just know that we're not alone and uh, yeah absolutely awesome. technology these days you're gonna have like a virtual coffee session or talk no on the kidding. Phone. no kidding oh nice janet put our email in there that that was really nice, Janet. And important. Yeah, really important. So Jonathan, my second wife, one year since her diagnosis, my first wife for several years before her death 11 years ago. Oh, Jonathan, I guess this time you'll be good at it, huh? Yeah. So I really, really appreciate all of you sharing because I think it gives everyone a pretty clear idea of all this stuff. Beverly says, uh, CDM is a blessing two days a week. I agree with you, Nancy. Yeah. So questions for Melissa or questions for anyone else. I appreciate you all being here so much. One of the things that I'm going to send out with our follow-up is a caregiver burnout index. Melissa, are you familiar with the burnout index? Yeah. Yep. I think it's a great tool to share. So about once a year. I provide it for the folks in my group, and I will never forget that one of them had made the comment that she thought she was doing okay, and then she did the index and found out that she was toast. Yeah. And so, and so it is really worthwhile to uh, check into to yourself to figure out exactly how it is that you're doing. Yeah. Really important. NAMI has some really good tools too. The National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, there are some really good assessment tools there and they're good for everybody. They are indeed. And that doesn't mean you all are mentally ill. No, nope, means that you have all. incredible challenges that, that can be very similar to uh, those who are suffering from mental illness. Yeah. So... Well, thank you, Melissa. If uh, if everyone has no more questions. So Anne says, I'm concerned about group members who have chronic illness or pain. And I think self-care should at least help with that. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is actually something that is worthwhile uh, keeping in mind that 
it's especially older people who are caring for a loved one with dementia, they often have illnesses of their own. Mm -hmm. If you were not aware, people who are uh, the caregiver at a very high frequency will lose their life before that person they're caring for. And the reason for that is often lack of self-care, such as not taking the time to go to the doctor, not taking the time to get sufficient rest or sufficient food, or uh, um, making sure that your blood pressure is where it ought to be, all of those kind of things. So that's just another thing to pay real close attention to is your own health. Can't take care of someone else if you're not well yourself. Yeah. Even see people forget to take their own meds because they're so worried about their loved ones. So yeah, be really sure. important. So thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful Easter. For those of you that are interested, we do have a memory cafe, which happens to be tomorrow at La Tida Coffee House in Vancouver. And anyone uh, is welcome to bring along their loved one and attend. It's lots of fun. Next month, the last Tuesday of the month, we will be having a webinar on uh, downsizing. We uh, It was one of our most popular last year. And so back by popular demand will be uh, Melanie Goff, who will speak to you about downsizing. And I, I will send <laughs> <laughs> you can attend that as well. Yes. You're yeah. awfully young to be downsizing. That's me that needs to do that. Um, so um, uh, I will send uh, out the uh, recording for people to be able to watch. Melissa tells me she doesn't watch her own recordings, but the rest of you are welcome to. And I'll also send out the information that Melissa provided for you here, including some of those uh, resources. So, and let's see. There is one question sure. about what is PCA? It is posterior cortical atrophy. I always have trouble, Janet, with the posterior. I get the cortical ac atrophy. So it is a, an unusual variant of frontal temporal dementia. Very, very rare, very early onset, and very difficult. Yeah. I don't know you, Susan, but I know Janet, and I got to tell you, I don't envy you. And I love the way that you take care of your loved ones. Yeah, and it says that, um, she says, not at all fun. I just saw, too, that the folks on this can't read these. So I don't know if Susan, we can get Susan Janet's email, because I don't know that she can see it. I'll make sure. Okay. With with uh, your permission, Janet, and I think you gave me permission by putting it in the chat. So. And then Janet said, caused by ALZ or Louie body. Okay. And it okay. says, yes, you can share it with Susan. All right. All right. So thank you all for coming. I'll get that information out by the end of the week. And uh, have a wonderful Easter. Thank you, Melissa, very much. Thank you all. Have a good night. Bye.